Hello there. This is um, uh, we are around the table again, and I am uh, for this edition. I'm joined by um, my friends here. We um, who are um, in no particular order. Um, George, how are Hi. you, George? I'm alright, thank you. Yeah, I'm doing good. Yeah. And then, hey, Frank. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, you're welcome. Right, guys. Um, we are talking about um, episode three of season three that's what i'm going to call it i don't care about this limited event series thing uh, it's season three to me of twin peaks uh, mm -hmm. um and uh so i've, I've written some notes i, I, I guess you guys have, i've watched it recently so you're kind of like yeah, we watched it earlier yeah yeah refresh, yeah. refresh your memories yeah, i've watched it about two to twice twice so um we kind of got we're kind of going to go through it kind of chron chronologically but if we kind of divert a wee bit it's okay as well yeah but, so I kind of put it in chronological notes. So when you ever you want to step in a comment about any section, please do. Okay. Oh, cool. um, right. It begins with um, Coop. And correct me if I'm wrong. Falling through space, or is yeah. he falling through liquid? Yeah, I'm never quite mind. clear on it. <laughs> I, I I read this as uh, falling through space as well. Mm. In my mind when I first watched it. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it does. It does seem like that, and he's and he's yeah. falling at some high velocity as well. <laughs> you know, you went back to when it was released, and they released um, well, they aired the first two episodes, and then they released this part and part four online. And I couldn't help myself but to watch it all. And I just remember watching this scene over and over again, just because I love um, David Lynch's use of special effects. It's not like overly polished it's a certain <laughs> to it. it's i i loved watching the, the way he shot dale falling through space i thought was incredible and the way like it was so intense and it was like you could hear the wind like yeah it's, like, it looks very violent doesn't it it's like yeah. sh shaking like that yeah. and uh, I, I, the, the bit i like is when you see the, the reverse side of him you know like we just see the back of him going down like that it looks yeah. like a little action doll <laughs> It looks like a little action man suspended on a wire. <laughs> it's just so bizarre. I, I've got to agree with George. It's perfect. You know? I, I, I agree with George, though, that the, the sound design as well, you know, what Lynch has done this season uh, it is amazing. And the mix of visuals and sound in this, uh, it was, you know, it was mind blowing. I mean, we had the uh, adrenaline ride of the f first two episodes of the season and then this came mm -hmm. a, a different um angle it was a different change in pace and style yeah. and and this was like was the first time in the season where it was going to be a, a, a message from lynch saying don't expect what you've just seen in the last episode we're going to take things and change it up a bit yeah. each week and don't have any expectations because uh, we're going to defy all of them yeah, I think the first two episodes. Oh, he did right, right from yeah, the off. <laughs> those first two episodes, and I love the ending of episode two because it really feels like um, you're settling back into town. But then I love how this one opens, just sort of Lynch going, "Okay, now we're getting into the really juicy stuff. Like this is the the real like creative part of my brain that I want to try and express visually." Yeah, I'm going to have a real crack at it. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. It's true. It was a very hard opening, um, stylistically, and certainly you know. Had this been the first episode, I think people new to the show would have just been like, huh, what is this? So <laughs> it came at the right time. Well, I, I, I'll be honest as well. Um, I, I have said this to Frank earlier. When I first watched episode three, it was one of the few episodes I didn't like and, and kind of struggled with. But now having seen <laughs> the whole season, uh, there is a lot hidden in this episode. And the appreciation oh, yes. I have for it is through the roof. And re-watching it has given me a lot deeper appreciation for this episode yeah I was I, I like I the, that's why i was kind of glad i was doing these because i literally it gave me a good reason to look back on them because i after it finished when when the run had finished i was so i think i think like a lot of people from what i can gather were completely kind of like to, for want of a better word lynched out you know by <laughs> by the whole yeah. thing yeah. um and um I had to take a break from it and take a step back from it because it was an awful lot, yeah. you know, it yeah, was an awful bombardment like, of the senses. Yeah, I, I completely... I kind of yeah. cheated by it all by the, by the end. Even though I loved a, a lot of it, an awful lot of it, um, I had to say, I had to say, look, I can't really watch any... I can't go back and start and rewatch it again. 
Yeah, I, I, I was so transfixed by it, you know, for, I, I completely sympathize with anyone, you know, that, that is a bit much and his style and everything can be a bit overbearing, but I was just so like focused and I couldn't take my eyes off it. It was every like second, every shot was just like, yeah, completely amazing. It was just blowing me away. Like I remembered Kyle before it started was saying, this is like nothing else in television. And then this was the episode I kind of realized this is like nothing else that anyone has put on television. That before. was the point. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's, I, I, re- I remember Machen said the same at the festival um, in 2015. She said, you know, this is Lynch changed television the first time round. He's going to do it again this time round. And I was like, that's a lot of hype to live up to. But it, it was true. It, we've seen stuff that I never thought mainstream television would show. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we, we, we so we've got we've got um, Dale flying through this you know this this space this strange space void or whatever. I, it is. I feel like can I yeah um, I I was reminded of in season two when Hawk is talking about the Black Lodge for the first time and he's talking yeah. about these worlds of the Black Lodge and the White Lodge and I guess if you're to been, um, if you're going to interpret that this mauve purple place is the White Lodge and Hawk talks about how you have to like sacrifice I can't remember his exact phrasing or whatever but it's like you sacrifice a lot of your soul in the Black Lodge or it's like you have to suffer through it in order to reach this enlightenment this White Lodge yes. experience yeah. and I feel like him, like him him traveling from the Black Lodge to the White Lodge and I was so like excited to see more of like because because I never thought the Black Lodge was just the Red Room I always imagined there were more ideas and I, I was yeah. so glad that um, this, this proved to me what I wanted to see in season three was not just a repeat of the old ideas and the old visuals that David had, but like all, all the other stuff that he's always wanted to show off and that he's always been thinking about making. Well, I, I was curious about this. I wanted to ask you guys about this. I mean, the Mauve Zone um, and even the, the space area, do you think the Mauve Zone is an extension of the Black Lodge or... Do you think it's perhaps more of a realm that's in between the black and white lodges? Because that, that's kind of how I interpreted it. I don't think this... I, I um, think it's just a bit in between. I think yeah. I've, part, part eight helps piece yeah. it together when you see yeah, um, it from those like blood red drops and it transitions into the, uh, the purple sea. And then, it, and then it transitions into the black and white room. And I feel like the mm. black and white room is purely the... The, the White Lodge, and, yeah, I and the Red Room is probably purely the Black Lodge, um, and this is sort of like an in-between stage where people might get mm-hmm. stuck or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Limbo. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, that's what I think, yeah, Limbo, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, that halfway point, um, yeah. Uh, um, so it, it really does start picking up into into pure surrealism as we as we get into this episode, which is... Abs- it, it, when I saw it, it was, a- it was absolutely spellbinding to me. This episode, this whole, this whole purple room uh, section of it was just amazing. I mean, he threw everything in, <laughs> into it, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, to you know, it was it, it was amazing. But we we, we we so we see we, Dale's there, and um, he's kind of like surveying his the landscape where he is and everything. Yeah. And really he enters this doorway this door that comes into this room it looks like a house at the, at the start and uh, we first see um, Nado hmm. um, uh, um, which is another in, very really fascinating character should we say uh, at, at this point of course we don't know how important she is to what happens later on um, she's she has no eyes she's you know she's blinded uh, and but she's trying to, com- to communicate with Dale um, and tell him something, but he's, you can see he's very, very confused by it all, and, um, and uh, he's, he looks like, where, where, you know, where am I, what am I doing here? Am I, I'm just adjusting from getting out of the, the logs and stiff, all this sort of thing. But out of the, out of the red, red room, I mean. Um, I'm curious if Dale has any, like, prior knowledge to this place. You know, way later in the season when he eventually wakes up, and he's using terminology like seeds, and it's as if him and Mike have been talking between seasons. Like, he seems to know a lot about this world. I'm curious if he was warned or told what he might be seeing as he tries to leave or anything. If this is, like, 
completely new to him of if he was expecting any of this. I, I think at this point it was very, very new. Um, mm -hmm. Frank, I, I, I'm guessing we're allowed to reference stuff that happens later on in the season. Yes? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so obviously we learned that Nido is Diane, which obviously gave a, a deeper meaning to the way that Nido was so frantically trying to um, prevent Coop, you know, going through this doorway and uh, and so we got to learn more about her but I mean the questions I have is like you know how long was Di Diane there as Nido and you know how did she get to this in-between place herself um you know, do you guys have thoughts on that I don't know when I initially watched it I I haven't really like conjured up any theories since she was revealed as Diane but when I initially watched it, I thought of her as like a Mike, no, not as like the man from another place, but of mm. the purple realm. Like, I, very I think much so, a guardian um, of this area. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think if the arm is like the main dude of the red room, and when I was first first watching this, it seemed like she was the the sole liver in that area. I, I and following on from that, I agree. When we see, you know, uh, Nido flung away from the bell on the box uh, after she turns that on, I oh, think yeah. that is the moment that she then goes off to Andy later on in the season yes. uh, at Jack Rabbit. That's where she's being rescued. That's where she's yeah. going to be rescued from him. Yeah, yeah. That would kind of make sense. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, because we're not we're, in that. In that, in, I mean, you see so many examples in the in the episodes, all, all eighteen episodes, that time is not linear, really. No, absolutely. And absolutely. Scenes aren't always chronological either. So some the things are past. happening like a day or two difference or something like that, and maybe some of these scenes are never explored again either. You know, we're jumping back and forth all the time with the, you know, with times and things like that. It, it things don't always add up. What, what were people's thoughts on um, Garland's head appearing, um, you know, when yeah. it comes to that, as Blue yeah. Rose? Because obviously, it's like, <laughs> you see him in the White Lodge, too. Floating so. yeah. like along, Blue Rose. Because I remember that pretty yeah. moment was on, and I was theorizing um, with all this stuff about Ruth Davenport, and I was thinking, okay, we have Ruth's head, and they found a body, and we have Garland's body, and I was, you know, thinking, but what happened to Garland's head? And then I remembered, oh, we've seen Garland's head already. We know where he is. He's he's in space. He's he's in that zone. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, what was his name? Bill Hastings. And he talks about his experience with Garland and how he just floated off and it was beautiful and everything. And it all seems to line up that. And, and I, I love that idea of all, all the uh, mysteriousness around Garland Briggs's character, um, and how much presence Donna Stavies has been given, despite obviously, unfortunately, not being able to return to the series, and how his character is still so like important and so mysterious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a, he's a big part of the mythology, and it was great that they could carry that on through the season. Same as Bob. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting now that we uh, after we yeah after we see we see that and, and NATO has been like propelled out into space. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Cooper makes his way back down the ladder, back into the room again, <clears throat> and we see a, a young woman at the fireplace who turns out when she turns around turns out to be Phoebe Augustine, <laughs> the American girl, or Annette, or, or whoever, or, or American girl as she was um, credited as. So we're not sure if this is Ronette or not. I mean, what do you think? This blew my mind when I first saw this because I'm a big fan of Ronette and of Phoebe Augustine. Um, and when I first watched it, my initial impulse was, this is Ronette. So then to see her credited as American Girl, I thought, mm, you know, this is a conscious choice to show us that it isn't Ronette. Yeah. Uh, but then I just can't answer the question of why David then cast Phoebe for this role that there, there must be some connection to Ronette but I just can't figure this one out um, and what what makes me more curious as well is it's the um, American girl who warns Coop that my mother is coming yes um, now I'm guessing that's referring to the mother of all evil or Judy but we obviously know Judy isn't 
necessarily Renette's mother, so yeah. it makes sense it's more a different character. But again, why does she wear the face of Renette? Could be that, that, like the like the devil is like, the great deceiver, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, the face. Yeah. Of people, you know? They take on the appearance of someone that you remember or, or mm. care for. You notice though that, that when when she turns around to him, you can see a, a, a glint of recognition on his face. Yeah. Yes. Oh, like, yes. He yeah. does recognize her. You know. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, that that's kind of interesting. Not, nothing said about that, but he does seem to recognize her. Um, okay. he has this yeah. Yeah. Um, now what, it, now the pace starts picking up really, really good. Now you've got this constant banging on the door and this music, um, you know, yeah. underneath and it's getting frantic. And, uh, mm. uh, we see this, we see this kind of thing on the wall, don't we? This kind of like, looks like a lock thing, you know, like a Pocket thing. thing. Yeah. Like an overblown socket. I, I love um, it's very oldie worldy, isn't it? You know, it's kind yeah. of old fashioned. It's got it's got the two slits of those American sockets, but obviously like overblown. You know, like leg sized. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I love that. That that makes me think. Um, that that's that has me thinking. It's like some kind of smaller world, some kind of like pocket dimension. Because uh, you see, when Bale climbs on top of this room, it's a lot smaller. Like. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Smaller on the outside, so I'm wondering what else kind of logic applies to this. It's very interesting. Yeah. It's interesting now that it, we, we and that we, we are seeing. This is the sort of point where we actually do see things running in real time at this point. This scene. Yeah, yeah. I, I like Hoop on the road in in his car, and yeah. the time on the on, on the clock in his car is two fifty three, two five three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is the, uh, the same time that it's happening, as you see on um, Phoebe's watch. Mm. So even though they're in different time zones, you know, worlds apart, with God knows what kind of dimension, it's that's a point where these two these two scenes are actually happening at the same time. Mm. Um, well, and it's well, creating chaos, you know. It, 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 it's, it, it looks like you know, it, it, um, Lynch has that habit of like zooming in and out, like you know, into something making it a bit out of focus, like with a cigarette lighter, you know. You see somebody's, somebody's trying to come out of that. <laughs> I'm yeah. assuming it's Cooper that's coming, going to come out that way, yeah. but <laughs> it gets boxed and it doesn't. Um, but it's implying something's, some force is coming out of that cigarette lighter. Yeah. And, um, I, I, that, I, I did not get it when I first watched it, and I rewatched it a couple of times and read some discussion threads on it. Yeah. It made sense, the whole, um, how he was supposed to be replacing bad coop and trying to get out the cigarette lighter um and then because the, for me this like explained all the dougie behavior immediately while everyone was like i know a lot of people were thinking what's wrong with dale for the whole season um and i was thinking it's because the process didn't happen properly and i i feel like if he came out of the cigarette lighter dale might have been fine he might have been acting the same normal Dale as always if you just replaced Bad Coop and Bad Coop went back to the lodge. But then, you know, of course, um, Mr. C took his precautions with Dougie and then he came out of like this wall socket, which didn't yeah. seem like a proper process. And then that kind of frazzled his brain because this wasn't meant to happen. It's some knockoff Dale that he's just replaced. It's not. <laughs> uh, and, and not only has Mr. C set up um, Coop by creating Dougie though he's also ensured that Dougie is actually the owner of the ring to make sure that mm -hmm. it's Dougie who gets back to the lodge mm -hmm. so I'm quite curious as to how Mr C um, got the ring to Dougie or whether Dougie Jones was just the kind of man who thought if someone sent him a nice ring through the post he would mm -hmm. wear it I don't know yes. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious why, how, 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 he, how he got that ring when, yeah mm -hmm. Back, you know. in, in the same way he might have just put it on him as soon as he made him but when did he make him again like 1997 was that when his birth yes, yeah that's when Dougie sort of appeared yeah. so I, I imagine he must have had some kind of amnesia as soon as he was created like uh, yeah what, where am I going? what like um and he could have just like slipped it on him then it's very clever Mr. C how he planned all this in a head um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing. See, that's the thing. He wasn't. 
he, he wasn't um, idle for 25 years. He was. But let's not forget at this point that Mr. C still had Bob inside him as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. So two of them, are, you know, he's got double the power yeah, at that point. <laughs> um, so because because I I didn't understand any of them. Um, this whole sequence about 20 minutes into the episode, like as especially when we first see real doggy, and I'm thinking, what's happening here? <laughs> who who is this other character, and why is it also being played by Kyle? And who's this? this prostitute he's with and why am I watching this now? I was watching Mr. C driving a car and Dale coming up the back lodge and why am I watching another doggy? What, who, who what? <laughs> it was all very bamboozling to me. It's changing at a different pace. Yeah, that's true. Uh, um, and the, the, the bit where, um, you know, Coop uh, is being, obviously being pulled back into the lodge, you know, when, you know, before he cr crashes in his car and, and throws up all that calm and pose. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Which the police get violently ill when they get near it. Near it, you know. Uh, one of them just drops straight down and vomits. So it's obviously but, really unpleasant. This stuff, um, but it, it also it sets up another thing later on where he's get, it, it, where Coop, Bad Coop's taken to jail, and that opens up another story as well. And not, let's not forget, we we also see the destruction of a tulpa for the first time, which also sets up the Diane reveal later on. Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I just wanted to t touch quickly on on that as well. Um, George mentioned earlier his like how the special effects vary in the quality, and this is something I spoke to Sabrina uh, Sutherland about, uh, and it was definitely a conscious choice by um, Lynch. Um, and the the um, the tulpa and destruction of the black smoke and the yes. golden orb is actually based on the artwork of Rene Magritte, and and there's a lot of his work has influenced the show, um, and and I, that just blew my mind how much like art has influenced the visual style, mm. um, and and I just thought even though it it didn't look like the best quality effect, it made so much sense for the show and. I feel like if, if, he really wanted it, mm. if he really wanted it, I feel like he could have made that, that golden orb look a little bit more realistic and not like, you know, a 2D drawing or whatever it did. But like, <laughs> um, I, I thought it fit really well. I think it just it suited his style. Yeah, like, I, I, I probably wouldn't accept it from any other show or director, but with David, I'm, I'm familiar with his short films, his animation before, it, it all sort of made sense, you know. Yeah. So Jade, who we see, Jade Two Rides, as he calls her, um, <laughs> takes him um, kind of, you know, takes him to uh, gets him kind of like ready. Um, of course, he's not really cooperating very much. He just keeps wandering around. But she gets him to um, the uh, casino, which is called the what's the name of that casino? Silver Lining. Silver Mustang. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a white horse, um, another description of a white horse. So, you know, it's a car as well, a Mustang. But, you know, there's, there's things being drawn already. So he, it's interesting that I'm wondering if some of these people, because their uniform is deep red, red and stuff. I mean, that just might, that might not be, there could be nothing to read into that. But everyone seems to be guiding him from one point to another and getting him to where he needs to go. Mm. Um, it, within the casino, I mean, you've got the, the lady, you know, he goes over with the money. She seems to be really worried about him a little bit, you know. Um, mm. Then he gets guided somewhere else, he's getting shuffled around, you know, where he needs to go. And and, and it's kind of interesting whether they could be possibly interesting. with the law, these people. Yeah, it's very interesting how people you know. responded to Dougie. Yeah. Obviously, it wasn't completely realistic if if you saw an actual like man who seemed a bit lost mm -hmm. and a bit not completely all together in the head you know you might oh, or something um but these people just seem to treat him as if he was any other person like they didn't notice he was repeating everything they said he, yeah yeah <laughs> um it's like how can I, these people not see like how if this was a real person, that, that I would be so concerned yeah. for him. Like, right. yeah. Mentally, see, not there. They just I sort of like you know, move him on his way and get get him, you know, yeah. and don't seem too concerned about him about his you know. To, to, to answer your point, though, Frank, I, I think that 
it's not something I'd thought about, but it, there could be a supernatural element to it there. I mean, you obviously he follows around the little red room symbol around the slot machines, yes. but yeah. even if you look at what the what he wins on the slot machines, mm. the the winning numbers is the seven seven seven, and obviously seven is a recurring number and theme throughout right. the show. Yeah, yeah uh, lucky seven, and all that stuff. The, 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 the lucky seven insurance, mm -hmm. yeah. things like that. I, yeah. I love those little um, red room flashes. Yeah. I, I, I always find that really funny, that bit, when it's because the music goes, ding, 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 ding. That, that <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a really funny scene anyway, because we, we also have the hilarious Mrs. Jackpots in there. Oh, she's uh, so sweet. She's so sweet, isn't she? Oh, yeah. That little really. <laughs> I love that she came back. Yeah. So, it, 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 and then it started, it started a catchphrase for, for a while with, hello. hello. <laughs> I still get people saying that. <laughs> it's iconic uh, now. But it's intriguing, uh, you know, so he, he's winning, uh, you know, every time. The, 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 so the Lodge wants him to, to, for a good reason, wants him to get this yeah. money. So I, I feel like it was Mike. I feel like all, all the stuff he was saying was all orchestrated by Mike, as if he had some kind of, like, yeah. master plan. Because everything he did that was influenced by the Lodge, buying the pie, saying that mm. um, Sinclair was a liar, you know, it, it all seemed to add up to I, the end where, I, like, I, everyone was able to. I'm going to pose a question following this point now that I, I typed down in my notes earlier, and that is, is Mike evil and working for his own evil agenda for the Lodge or with Mr. C, or is he playing both sides against each other, or is he helping Coop? Um, I, because I think certainly by the very end of the season, when we see, you know, Coop meet with Mike, you know, as he goes through the portal under the Great Northern, everything goes wrong from that point on and i just can't help but feel and especially even more so watching it back through a lot of this yeah so i always thought that mike was pretty passive that he was he exists within the red room and in the real world and he passes through and he meets people but i, I don't know if i ever I'm not sure. I always assumed he was more on the good side than the bad because of, uh, we don't know much about him, but the backstory we do have is um, he had that arm with the tattoo of fire walk with me, and then he cut that off, which eventually turned into Michael Anderson. And I always assumed that was the, the evil part of him that he cut off when he saw God or whatever it was he said. Mm -hmm. So I, I figured he was someone to trust. But like Frank, you were saying earlier, um, even in the original series, he was a bit, you, you weren't sure if you could trust him. It was a bit, um, you know, what, what's the word you're looking for? Yeah. You, for, you know, for, yeah. for me, I, I, I've got to say, I found... In the original series, I would have agreed with that statement fully. He was very passive, and more often than not, he has been helpful. And I think maybe Philip Gerard is a good guy, but definitely mm. Mike, um, he's been a bit on the fence and a bit ambiguous. But um, certainly for me, it, as I said, it was after seeing him go to the base. Uh, when Coop and uh, Diane go through the portal underneath uh, the basement of the uh, Great Northern, Everything went wrong after that. He knew about Mr. C uh, creating the um, Dougie Jones tulpa. He knew about Diane being a tulpa. He, he knew everything that was going on with Coop. Uh, and now I am sold uh, on the idea that he is very much a puppet master who's kind of manipulated a lot of what's happened. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think a lot of stuff in part 17 gets a bit discombobulated as soon as we get to the sheriff's station. So a lot of the stuff after that, I don't know, I, I take it with a bit of a grain of salt. I think yeah. for, for most of the season, um, with the Las Vegas storyline, um, it seems at the beginning everyone's in a bit of a kerfuffle, but by the end everyone seems to have flipped their script and is nice. Like, um, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, like Sinclair seems to have seen a positive side and um, I'm forgetting all their names, um, <laughs> but but you know what I mean. But by, by the end, yeah. like um, everyone's nicer. 
Naomi Watts is nicer. It's it, it all seems a lot more wholesome, and all that seems to have um, arrived because of the help of the Black Lodge to mm-hmm. dug the whole season, or they all, I should say. Um, and and I always assumed, like in part three, when we see that um that little snippet of the black room above the jackpot machines, um that's like Mike trying to reach through, trying to say, trying to guide him somewhat, um as if he has some kind of um knowledge of the future, the whole. Is it future? Is it past? Does he know more than we do? Um, I, I just wonder whether a lot of the characters are pawns in a greater chess game between yeah. um, Mike and the Black Lodge entities um, and um, the fireman or the giant, however we want to refer, because he too obviously has manipulated a lot, like, you know, Freddie coming over uh, yeah, to Washington yeah. and, you know, teaching Andy about what's happened. You know, there, there's certainly been manipulation of events on both sides of the lodge. Yeah. Yeah, we got actually. There's a few things we missed during the during uh, uh, that we didn't bring up, which are kind of important as well. Uh, I just, I just, I'm gonna just very. We won't go into it too much because we need to move forward, not going back. But mm-hmm. there's a few points that we missed um, uh, earlier that I forgot to fill the gaps in with. Yeah. Um, when Jade is taking uh, um, Coop, I still call him Coop because he is. Yes, it is and Coop. It is Coop. <clears throat> he's not Dougie. No. Dougie has been, um, you know, disposed of at this point <laughs> in, the, in the lodge. He's just, um, everyone thinks he's Dougie, but he's still Coop in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, we just want to try and get that kind of like straight, really, because a lot of people get it mixed, kind of get confused yeah. a little. I feel like uh, I... Uh, um, but I it's interesting because when, when Jade is taking him, um, you know, Jeep to, to the casino, she... Well, just before that, she 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 goes through his pockets mm. and finds the great yeah. northern room key. I love that. There's a clue already, um, and it's kind of has a glimmer of recognition for him as well as it goes along. Um, so already, it's kind of like piecing things together a bit from for his long journey back yeah. to yeah. how he was before. Um, but there's two hitmen after him, after Dougie, rather for some reason, assuming that's it's to do with owing money or something, uh, I, I think, at this stage. Um, to see but it goes, it, go, it, it goes wrong, because <laughs> he's, he's picking up <laughs> the Great Northern Key. They go over a bump, he drops the key, mm-hmm. and they miss, you know, they think she's on her own, and so the hit doesn't happen. It, that's a kind of nice sort of cliché way of getting around it, I suppose. I'm trying to uh, remember, was it when, when he's in the Jeep, and he sees uh, a yeah. street sign. Yes, he sees. He Yes, he's he's sick, sick on the street. street. Yeah. yeah. And I remember that's the right. Yeah, the slants look caught, and there's this, that, and the other. Yeah, it's all linking yeah. back to the the. Yeah. He's he sees Sycamore Street. Yes. Referring back to the trees of Twin Peaks, uh, mm-hmm. and this, you know, when you think about it, there's been a lot of little moments of recognition that we've mentioned already. You know, with him recognizing Ronette and Sycamore Street, the Great Northern. Yeah. One of my favorite things in um be it a television that's like in its tenth season or if it's come back after a while or if it's just like at the end of a mini series. I love it when they bring it all together or they like refer back to the early days or whatever. And I know in a lot of these reboots that have been happening lately, it's done a bit tastelessly. It's done a bit like, oh, we're gonna say this whole catchphrase because remember this, you know, but yeah. I love how it was handled in the new season, especially with everything that had to do with Coop in Las Vegas, when he would keep recognizing everything. And yeah. it wasn't quite going in, but like stuff like the red heels and yes. uh, yeah. and the, yeah. the American flag. And it was all like sort of, it was, it was triggering something in his head, but he couldn't quite remember. But for us, um, the, there were all these symbols, like the owl flying over, that we, we knew what they meant. And I thought that was a really nice way to call back to the original series. Yeah. With a bunch of... Clear that this that From the beginning that Lynch and Frost have set out, this is not a nostalgia trip. This is something new and it's moving forward. Yeah. Uh, all the same, the, the, especially with the... the past, yeah. All the same, it's got those little things in there if you're if you, if you, if you observant, you know, mm. this, this little nods back, you know. But, the color I, I, red, for instance, is 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 right is, is, is strewn throughout it. Um, you know, um, particularly the red balloons—they pop up a lot. 
Oh, yes, Moses. Yes. Um, again, I think uh, a callback, a probably a, con a, a conscious or self-conscious callback, callback to the red room, I would think. Um, the, the, the red, the color red. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in particular, the, the um, we see the 119 girl for the first time. Yes, I was going to ask. I mean, this is and, the one and thing. Behind there is a red balloon, and that's the first sort of sign we see. And these balloons keep coming back. I mean, what are your what are your thoughts on one one nine woman? Because this is one well, of the few mysteries that I, I yeah. am just lost with. I think there's there's a lot of stuff in this series that David throws in, doesn't elaborate on. I don't think that's a bad thing. He, no, I agree. He has a bunch of ideas. He just throws it all together. Like the Polish accountant came out of nowhere, <laughs> never saw him again. Doesn't matter. Yes. You know? It was funny though. <laughs> <laughs> <Get> any money <laughs> <laughs> but um i think the 119 girl i think people are focusing on her because she she's strange i think the reason that the important thing was her eight what who i assume was her son um the little boy because yeah uh, the the important thing to keep um referring back to those characters in that scene was dougie's car and then when that blew up and the people were trying to steal that and we see that through the eyes of the boy so i think in a narrative perspective it's like we're, we're going to keep tabs on this family across the street. This boy is going to see this, um, but we can't just have a boy in a house alone, so we've got to have a mum. And in David Lynch's mind, he's like, well, if he's going to have a parent, let's make it this really twisted, uh, let's make it this really depressing scene, because yeah, yeah. it's realistic, yeah. I guess. You know? like the most dysfunctional <laughs> thing going yeah. Exactly. Um, so, so, something else I just wanted to quickly touch on before we move on, uh, regarding to when Coop came back. Obviously, he comes through with the socket, uh, with the um, suit on. Now, I just wondered why you think they chose, n well, narratively, it makes sense for him not to have the FBI pin. Mm. Um, but within the universe, do you think that there was a force that prevented that pin coming through? I don't know what happened to the pin. We, we see he lost his shoes. Yeah, I think there was. So he has we, to find his way, his identity, you know, in, in the way it has to be planned. It's all Almost planned. like a spiritual spiritual test of rediscovery i think so because yeah. because yeah. you remember yeah, when he's um, behind as well yeah, yeah you remember when the, the the fusco detectives uh uncover that oh his fingerprints match with this uh missing fbi agent and they toss it away because they don't believe it but i i feel like if he had his fbi pin narratively yeah. like you said it would be think, like yeah. oh we're gonna look you up we're gonna see who you might be you know? yeah narratively, identity, uh, it makes discovering sense. identity i think in the way it had to be mapped out for him Okay. But there is interesting stuff way around <laughs> later on in part 17 and 18 because yes. they keep switching between different pins and an upside down pin and whatever. But oh well, um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, there, was, there was some other stuff I was going to So, yeah, that's interesting because you say, um, you know, after they had that failed hit with trying to get Dougie, they plant, as you said, they plant the, uh, the, bo the bomb underneath Dougie's car, which is parked up mm -hmm. in. Now we discover this other place, this this um, town called Rancho Rosa, hmm. um, which is also in the opening title. It's Rancho Rosa co-production, whatever it is. Yeah, you know? that, that's interesting. So there. I, I assume that's an Easter egg or something. Yeah, oh, that's all that's supposed it's to kind be. of like a different Twin Peaks to me. I always think it's just like slightly anti Twin Peaks, a bit like what Deer Meadow was. You know, I I I, I agree. I think it was very much intended as an anti Twin Peaks. It, that you know the luscious green is replaced with this dry desert and. Mm. The sense of community is people behind closed doors. It that was, was another thing. Yeah, that I kind of yeah. um, just accepted at this point. But I'm remembering back to when I first watched it, uh, even in part one. But I was <clears throat> ecstatic to see it continue on throughout the whole season. That it didn't just take place in Twin Peaks. That yes. we've expanded the world. We've we're looking at New York. We're That's looking right. at Las Vegas, other parts of the country, other parts of the world. Um, seeing it for the first time if you don't include that one deleted scene of Philip Jeffries, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it was really kind of refreshing to see. I know a lot of people wanted it to just go back to Twin Peaks, um, but I, I kind of always had the feeling, which did kind of end up happening, that as the season went on, we would spend more and more time in Twin Peaks. Yeah. At the beginning, I feel like it was very, um, he had a lot, David had a lot of stuff to set up um, yeah. that would eventually culminate um, but 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 very scattered at the beginning, and I feel like it's kind of purposeful. Like, forget about the old show. Let's not like make you so comfortable, and then suddenly throw in a bunch of new stuff. Let's start with the new stuff. Like, throw you in the deep end, and then you'll kind of figure it out as you go along. You know? 
Yeah. And I, I think I think that links as well with the the show's um, title of the return. You know, it's a return for Cooper to Twin Peaks, for fans mm -hmm. to Twin Peaks, for Cooper to reality. Um, and this sense of rediscovering himself. There's a lot of returns going on in this. And An awful lot. Yeah, there is. It's not just one particular element. It's quite a lot. Yeah, as you say. Yeah. I think um, about the hitmen, I think I've always assumed all the hitmen that were after Dougie, the people who planted the bomb in his car, I think that was all about Duncan Todd. And I yeah, think Duncan Todd famous Todd, yeah. And I think, I think Mr. C's just been keeping tabs on Dougie. Um, he had a million likes. Uh, fail safes set up to try and get A to get Dougie to be the one to replace or Dale to replace Dougie and not him. And then as soon as that happens, he is setting on all these hitmen. He sets on Ike the Spike and all these assassins to try and kill Dougie as quick as possible because they can't both be there in the same world, which is what we've planned. Um, yeah, at this at this point, Mister C probably doesn't know that Dougie and uh, Coop may have. Well, he may have a suspicion, you know, because of the the vomit and stuff. But you know, he might not necessarily know that Dougie and Coop have switched. So obviously, he's going to have hitmen there just in case somehow Dougie is still around. Yeah, yeah, he's trying to he's trying to um, have every eventuality covered. Yeah, but yeah. <clears throat> well, he's had a lot of time to do it, as, as we know. But there's a, a small thing that I was interested in when I was rewatching it because I, I was looking for it this time. When you see the Rancho Rosa logo, um, and Jade is driving past that out of the um, suburbs, and you see in the background is a hooded figure pushing a trolley. Do either of you see this? There's, no, I can't say I've ever noticed that. There is a hooded figure. I still didn't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I watched it earlier tonight. It's a small thing, but even still, I know that it must be intentional because they would be on set and David would have put this guy in the background. Um, so do you think the hooded figure could be in a, a nod to uh, a dweller on the threshold? What it looks like is um, when Garland gets kidnapped in season two and he sees that hooded figure yeah. by the light in the background and it's like the exact same hood and fully draped in black. It's very interesting. God, I it happens to be there. This is actually a physical person that near the sign or actually on the sign. Physical person, like with a trolley, just walking by the sign, walking by them as- Just as they're passing by in the queue. Yeah. I'll have to look at that again. That's interesting. Very interesting, yeah. Yeah. And you know, we uh, we touched on the scenes in the casino earlier as well, and we've got to mention the cool cameos in that scene. Obviously, we had Sabrina Sutherland there yes, as right. yeah. floor attendant Jackie, Jackie the slot and, baby, yeah. <laughs> and but also we uh, we have for Walking Dead fans, Josh McDermott uh, has had a oh, small cameo as well. That was another one. I remember when the original cast list, cast cast list, excuse me, was uh, released. Um, and they had these names on it. They had Jane Levy. They had Michael Sarah, which I think everyone guess would be Andy and Lucy's kid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they had uh, Josh McDonough, and I'm a Walking Dead fan. So I was like, oh, I wonder what he's going to be. And then he pops in for literally one line and leaves. And then as <laughs> a couple of episodes go that by, and I'm quite a bit <laughs> in the series, yeah. Some guy, that doesn't even matter. And I'm just thinking, like, they have all, beyond Josh McDonough, because he isn't too much of a celebrity, but he has a name at least. But they have so many famous people they have um this name ernie hudson who oh the guest from ghostbusters yeah yes and right. it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. so many people cameoing which is really great i guess a lot of people were just like this is david lynch making a new series i want to be a part of it i want to be a part of this um this whole vision this whole new thing that he's making whatever it is because who knows if it's going to be the last one and but i think he, it's great this... amount of respect you can see across Every actor. I think a lot of them would say, yeah, God, I've never worked with Lynch before. This could be, this is a golden opportunity. I don't care, just, I don't care how long I'm in it for. Let me do it, you know. And, and from a production point of view, from David's creative point of view, again, he's subverting expectations. He, he knew that we'll have seen this cast list and think, okay, these are going to be the major players. And actually, he turned it on his head. We have a lot of new uh, and upcoming stars taking the main we roles. We do. I, I just think it's great how much opportunity David and Mark were both given with this whole thing because obviously they have the reputation they have you know all these people who would be willing to do it at this point so theoretically I imagine they could have picked anyone they like I love David's um casting route like he, he likes to pick good a good face or familiar people oh yeah 
Um, he, he's very good for this casting. And I feel like... Shout out to Joanna for casting. Yeah, which is very, a yeah. very fortunate position for Oh, me. yeah, yeah. Really good casting um, people he has. They always seem to have a knack of getting the right people, you know. Mm. Uh, it, it's extraordinary, really. No matter how small the time, screen time they have, exactly. they always make their mark, you, you know. Yeah. If they get one line, they make it, it's, it, it becomes memorable. It's yeah. amazing. Probably, by the um, end of the season, I just learned to accept it. But at the beginning, I, I was always thinking, like, I wonder if we'll ever see that one character that was in that one scene again, or if that was just it. I, mean, I, I, I learned to accept it pretty quickly. The only person who I was dying to see uh, was my good friend Julie Cruz, and uh, boy, <laughs> did David make me wait for that. <laughs> I always, I always thought that once they started doing the musical performances in there, that became a regular thing. Yeah. I always thought that she'd be the last one on there. Same. Yeah, because yeah. I was thinking, yeah. oh, if they're going to end every episode with a musical performance. When are they going to do? It makes sense to have if, it. if it wasn't going to be for the first episode, it's got to be for the last one or something. Which bit? Uh, we, yeah. we have Hawk, Hawk Lucy, and yeah, Andy, and thing. the bunnies. Yeah, it's not about the bunny. <laughs> <laughs> this scene was genius. It was great seeing these guys again. And it was me up when I saw it. Yeah. And the don't up disturb sign on the door. I thought that was really that was genius. <laughs> genius. <laughs> and it's it a but it's just this long scene, or it seems long now. And that's another interesting thing. When you first watch these scenes originally, mm. they seem a lot longer than they do on rewatch. Especially. It, it, it seems to be much more, not super fast paced, but they don't seem as long as you, you remember them, if you know what I mean. It's true. I, I remember watching the casino scene with uh, Mr. Jack Potts and thinking, okay, this is getting tiresome now. Mm. On the rewatch, it flew by. I was like, yeah. huh? It does. <laughs> the hour just goes by so quick. It's unreal. Yeah. yeah. And anyway, that scene is really funny. And, and, and Lucy's feeling so guilty about eating the bunny. And they're, all, they're getting kind of cross wires for a little while. You know? do, do either of you have any um, thoughts on the bunnies? Or their significance. Well, I, I'm I kind of thinking back to the bunny. You know, the bunnies in the original series. You know, well, uh, it's, it's, it's the bunny. same box. If you I, look, I, yeah. I it's think twenty five years. <laughs> I, think, I think it was. I think it was comedy value. Yeah. Although, obviously, we do have Jack Rabbit's palace. Oh, so yes. Yes. yes, as soon as that was brought up, and it was like Jack Rabbit's palace, and I was thinking, Rabbit's bunny. Maybe it's about the. Bunny. It's about the bunny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Drip feeding little little hints to something later on. Yeah, I yeah. think in a, in a, in a kind of funny way, you know. Yeah, but it's I there. The, the only other rabbit, thing. actually, that, another thing I just thought about recently, um, because it's it's quite clear that when you look at um, the later episodes, in particular at episode eight, hmm. how much of Lynch's earlier works is thrown in in that. In those yeah, things. it's it's especially, it's especially interesting. And Jack, often... Jack Rabbit, of course, was the name of the rabbit in Inland Empire. Exactly. Yeah. The yeah. rabbit, you know, the rabbit's um, section. Yeah, and of course... Jack Rabbit. Rabbit. So again, Jack Rabbit's power. It's all kind of like... And of course there's Virgin. Rabbit itself, the web series. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I actually, uh, I, I actually spoke with um, the director, Kevin Smith, um, about the new Twin Peaks. Um, and he's a big fan. And he said to me that... The first four episodes, he was like, I felt I was watching more of a Lost Highway, Inland Empire hybrid, and then it became Twin Peaks. Exactly. And certainly, I mean, this is Twin, uh, this is David Lynch's celebration of his career because it is, it really is. I, I think literally all of his work, both as a filmmaker, but also as an artist and uh, a musician, everything. Uh, um, is covered mm. in Twin Peaks. He, he has really? a knot for everything. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, everything. Before, it's thrown in like a bit like a big pudding bowl and just yeah. Yeah. Before, during, and after this whole series, I've been researching, looking up everything and anything David has done. Um, on, on my laptop now, uh, no kidding, I have every single commercial, every single music video, every single short film he's ever uh, made, or as much yeah. stuff as I can as is left that yeah. was on biggerlynch.com um oh, i have yes. all of this stuff and it's so so interesting to look back on it especially after watching the return and you can see so many things that are, you like, see it now all those visuals yeah. from his early shorts like the alphabet 
Yeah. Those exactly. visuals were those visuals were in the atomic bomb sequence. Yes. yes. You know the early like little dots flying around and the like that was all from the alphabet and stuff. All you know, all these different visuals you were seeing. Those quick things going around and stuff. We're all there. You know, you only have to look at thing, you know, you know. The the evolution of the arm as well. That, you know, some of his artwork you can see where how that's inspired it. Yeah. Oh yeah, with, yeah, that's right. With his early model making and all that stuff, mm-hmm. it's all there. The other, you know, like the uh, uh, razor head, the razor head head. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, harks back a little bit to the baby head. You know, things like that. But yeah, he threw everything in. It definitely was a tour de force. It's definitely you know, links his all his works can be seen all the I way through. If you you know, it's really good to complement anything he's ever made before. So it's especially interesting to rewatch all of that and see its influence in the return and vice versa. It's all like you can tell it's all part of the same hive mind. Like yeah. this is definitely the same creative person doing what he does best. And it, it's really it's a really great thing to watch. I think it just um elevates his whole career to another level. And this is why I, I consider the return literally a celebration of his own career. And mm. the, he's drawn, as I said, that he's drawn literally all his previous work into this but it doesn't feel like a rehash because it's an more of an evolution of what's come before and it's yeah, yeah. fresh and it's exciting and you know david i think he's in his 70s now right and he's still one of the most creative visionaries that yeah. uh, we have in film and we are very lucky to live in a time where we get this kind of work yeah. we're very lucky to get for season three despite what's you know i know some opinions have been divided about it yeah. much fandom um <clears throat> when you think about it did we ever first of all i never ever thought it would come back no i mean I, I, and and now it did come back it still seems unreal to me that it even happened you know i've watched it all i've rewatched it all i think i still can't believe we got those 18 hours it's just it's i i really, have really extraordinary you know? in retrospect kind of because i have a different viewing experience than you do obviously um I, I wasn't there i wasn't alive when it was on um and when i did watch it, it was about the time it was announced it would be coming back yeah. I, I watched it in 2013 or 14 i think um oh. my mom got me the box set because it was like just announced that these people were thinking of bringing it back so she and like david wasn't even on board so she got me the whole series like watch it before some new creators might muck it up you know um, so I got into it then, and then from then, like, in retrospect, I'm thinking it's a brilliant thing that this was even able to come back at all. Yeah. And I'm very grateful that it was. You know. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we, we've got to praise each other as fans as well, because mm-hmm. the fans did play a humongous part in bringing the show back, you know, uh-huh. with the, all the letters, petitions over the years, the, um, you know, no Lynch, no Peaks campaign, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, it was really beautiful. And that is the legacy of Twin Peaks, is that not only is it a TV-changing uh, show, it's created what is undoubtedly, in my opinion, the greatest fandom on Earth because there is so much love between all the fans and the uh, cast and crew of the show. It, it's like nothing I've ever seen. Mm. I find it very unique because I'm not into like fandom groups you know of other genres very much yeah uh, um i don't follow stuff very much you know um or go to events or things like that, you know to connect it with other series or long-running series or whatever it might be i always had a soft spot for twin peaks you know since it first broadcast the original series and up to the point where i discovered fandom because i, I didn't discover fandom until 2010 online when i went to the first uk yeah. fest um and then I, then it kind of opened up a new world to me in fact when i started making friends so I, you know before that it was very much a solitary thing watching the episodes at home i didn't know any any fellow fans locally or anything like that yeah. you know so now it's completely different it's great because we're all connected I, 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 don't know any, I, I barely know anyone um especially my age who watches it um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't know anyone. I say, uh, and I'm going back when it first transmitted in 1990, and there was no, I had no, so it was really hard, you know, watching it and not being able to chat with someone the next day about it or yeah. whatever, because there was no one around and the internet wasn't 
up and running, really. <laughs> so you had no kind of like way of like, um, commu- you know, no, there was no community thing. Uh, but I'm also glad as well that David um, went against the idea of going to Netflix or releasing it all and binging because that, really has also, that, that has also been a brilliant part of this season is oh, having that week to digest it, mm-hmm. share your and thoughts you, with a fan. Yeah, exactly. And it, it was that made better stuff. by the fact of how long the season was. It was 18 parts. And I think about it, it went from May to September. It took up my entire summer. Every yeah. week, I was like analyzing. It was a it was a summer of lynch, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get back to this now because we we haven't got yeah, long now, right. guys. So I was thinking, um, the lovely the, bit, the lovely bit now is that we go to the FBI headquarters in Philadelphia. Yeah, I was going to say, but finally but, meet, yeah. finally meet Gordon uh, Gordon Albert and Tammy Preston, which is just great. I, I was going to say just just before then, um, yeah. after straight after Andy and Lucy scene, and yeah. The talk, uh, we have about a two to three minute scene of Jacoby painting shovels. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and, I think that, that was and again, you, when you look at it now, it, it's not that long, but it probably seemed forever when you first watched it. I think it was, um, I thought it was a really great breather moment in such a crazy episode. That's yeah, just like a sort of zen moment to have a little. Just, just I think, back and relax. I can't remember, I think it's exactly like two minutes and 17 seconds or something. Yeah. But um, and I think that's like also exactly the same amount of time that was the sweeping scene later on in the season. And also- yes, that, that felt a lot longer. <laughs> a lot longer. Yeah. Also, also the same length as the smoking scene between oh, yeah. Diane and Cole. And yeah, 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 yeah. That seemed, that seemed to go on for an agonizing time. The three scenes are roughly yeah. about the same length. And it's almost as if David found the perfect like Time just to sort of like stop and digest and just like savor the moment. And just <laughs> yeah, it was good. I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I, I loved Dr. Jacoby in the original season, um, but I did find these scenes kind of tiresome, to be honest. However, when we got the payoff of him and Nadine, I was like, <laughs> okay, that was worth it all. That was worth it all. Yeah, that's the thing. It just pays to like to, to uh, stay with it, stick with it. That's what, you know, yeah. that's the way it works. Yes, um, FBI. Uh, Tammy um, um, showing slides or pictures of the glass box attack. You know the box. I love, yes, the, yes. I love how it was already all coming together. Like, yeah, oh, this is what New York is tying into. It's tying into this this group of people that we love. You know. Yeah. And I, I have to say, my my heart broke immediately when I saw um Miguel Ferro. Uh, I just realized I was so happy that he had such um what was clearly going to be such a leading role this season. Yeah. Yeah, so pleased that he was in nearly all of it. Yeah, he was in nearly all of it, and I, I just thought maybe he might be in a couple of episodes. But by God, did he have a chunk of it? I know a lot. I of, we get that one was big. only in one. Uh, bless him, as well as I know he wasn't well at that point as well, and I didn't think he. Was, I didn't know he'd shot so much until exactly. we got. You know, you know, Fold. It wasn't just surprising that Miguel had such a large role, but also um, Gordon Cole as well. Yes. You know, just David was doing uh, the script, uh, directing it, the sound design, and to give a substantial it. role. <laughs> you you know, this guy, this guy very, is, is in every pie. Character this season. Yeah. And, and he was a revelation in it. I thought he was brilliant in it. Mm. Yes, fantastic. He uh, had the chops for acting. He really showed it off on that, yeah. right? Yes, Cole was elevated from this comedy character from the original one to actually a very, very deep, complex character this uh, season. And I I like that a lot. Foresight about things, like a psychic kind of connection with things and stuff like that. Like all his visions of Laura, and he seemed to have an extra knowing, like when when he almost went through the portal. And it all seemed so apt that it was played by David. It seemed like, I don't know if if it was... um, if I was just seeing David in Cole or vice versa, or if it even mattered, because it just fit, like, and like, what, what do you like him speaking through the screen to us? Like, this is my thing, and yeah. I'm very spiritual in this, and it's all making sense to me. It's, I love what, what did you guys think of Tammy as a new character? Right. So I read the secret history before the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so did I. And I also listened to the audiobook because that's yeah. my preferred way of reading is to read along to an audiobook. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I loved, um, I forget the actress's name who played Tammy in the audiobook. Oh, that was, um, she, she's on the new, the, the, she's the, the main 
well, she's like the one voice on the final dossier audio yeah, now as yeah, well. Yeah. That's an actress called Annie Wershing. Mm, yes. Plays Was she in? Tamara Preston on it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but anyway, um, so I, I just had that image of her already. And then it was Krista Bell, which I was also just as pleased at because um, I knew her, I knew she did um, the, the Polish poem for Inland Empire. That's right, they go back quite a way. Yeah, another, in before that, in before yeah. that, actually, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm I not going to lie, I had to learn to love to, to grow to love Tammy, I think. Acceptable. Yeah. I, I think she didn't start off in the best way, um, but I don't think that's entirely um, Krista's fault as an actress. I think the character was overly sexualised in a way that didn't seem necessary, uh, which was obviously a stylistic choice from Lynch. Mm. I feel like um, yeah. But however, she did evolve as a character and she did prove her worth to the being on the Blue Rose task force. Yes. And in the end, I, I ended up being quite a big fan by the end of the season. Yes, yes. And, yes. and that, that, that's credit. That is credit to Krista Bell yes. for being yeah. able to change think, an opinion so massively. Yeah. yeah, I think there was part of me that, um, you know, I, I was I was having trouble finding the character who I liked from The Secret History yeah. um, in Krista's character in the show. Um, but then I, that didn't really matter because obviously the book was written separately from when David was writing the show and Mark was writing the book. Um, but I think, on touching on the whole sexualizing of her, I think I, I know Christabel spoke out on it on that she didn't mind because she likes the female form and all that, which is fair. Um, and I know people like to call David a misogynist or something. I've always said he's not a misogynist; he just um, portrays misogyny as well as other human horrors of the world. Yeah. Um, I think it, it was just very, um, you know, believable that Albert and Cole and Gordon Cole were the kind of characters that would, you know, look at her behind, etc. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I think you I think you hit the nail on the head early when you said that um, Lynch injected a part of himself into Cole because obviously Lynch is an admirer of beautiful women and we see this with Cole both with Tammy, uh, with Diane, and um, y with Monica Bellucci as well. You know, but it, I, I thought that was a great, um, those characters were a great place to end the episode. Yeah. So I just want to thank Ben and George for joining me. It's been a pleasure speaking with pleasure. you guys. Yeah. It's Thanks always a pleasure, Frank. Thank you.